From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. For those of you who can remember back to 1985, you might remember the Farm Aid concert with Willie Nelson and John Mellencamp and Neil Young and all kinds of people. That concert, which was all about helping farmers, raised a ton of money and it kept going year after year. It's coming up on 40 years of this concert, which has actually morphed into a festival and a thriving nonprofit providing all kinds of services. We'll be hearing all about that right after these quick messages. Apply now for Kivira Coalition's new Agrarian Program Fellowship. Supercharge your current or upcoming job into an even deeper learning experience. It's designed to be an extracurricular addition to a working experience on a farm or ranch. Fellows will receive access to a community of support and additional resources to supplement their experience and advance their careers in regenerative agriculture. Go to kiviracoalition.org slash newagrarian slash fellowship for more information and to apply. Kivira, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A, kiviracoalition.org. And you can just go ahead and apply. It's rolling admissions. And Kivira's spring season of workshops is up and running. Check out the in-person workshop on soil health in West Texas and the two webinars, the Carbon Credit Conundrum, which is an ongoing series, and Meet Business Fundamentals. That's all at kiviracoalition.org slash events. And before we go to our program, I'd like to thank our newest Patreon patron, Diane Karp. Big hugs to you. Thank you so much for supporting Down to Earth. And if you would like to become a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. It's easy to join. You can join at any level and every little bit makes a difference. Thank you. And now to our program. I'm so happy to welcome to Down to Earth, Jennifer Fahey. She's Communications Director for Farm Aid. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So some people, especially of a perhaps slightly older generation, might remember Farm Aid as this huge festival in 1985 with Willie Nelson and other musicians. That was the beginning. Tell us about the origin of Farm Aid, and then we'll talk about what this organization has become. You're right. A lot of people do go back to that initial festival, which actually was a concert then, and we can talk about how we changed that through the years. But yeah, the first concert was held in 1985, and it was Willie Nelson who, actually inspired by a comment made by Bob Dylan at Live Aid about the farm crisis that was unfolding here in the U.S., Willie took that on himself when Bob said, you know, maybe we should do something to help our farmers here in the U.S. too. It was about six weeks from that initial inspiration to the concert that happened in Illinois in 1985, September 22, before 80,000 people at um, the University of Champaign's uh, football field. And in the weeks leading up to it, Willie brought John Mellencamp and Neil Young on board. Um, So the three of them are considered the founders and have been committed to the organization and the work ever since. And that first concert, gosh, it had, I think, more than 50 performers for sure. It raised about uh, $7 million, and initially that was it. That was sort of what was planned. You know, Willie Willie took the inspiration and said, I'm going to do what I can do to help the farmers. That's music, and that's bringing my friends together. We're going to raise money. And equally, Willie was committed to raising awareness as well because, you know, as, as he and John Mellencamp later put it, they thought that if they raised that awareness of the problem, that the folks in Washington would wake up and jump into action and and solve it. And so that money was raised during that first concert, and then it began to be distributed all around the country. Willie Nelson and and the executive director that he brought in, who had no idea she was going to be the executive director for the next 39 years, (laughs) 
<laughs> she right. thought this was sort of temporary job. She moved around the country with Willie, meeting with farmers, meeting with farm groups, um, learning what the challenges were, learning what the solutions were. And Willie and Carolyn, Carolyn Mugar is our executive director, they have always said farmers know what the solutions are. It's just that Washington isn't necessarily paying attention. And so the money was distributed all across the country to these farm groups. And really, at that time, some of them weren't farm groups. They were folks who had come together to say, well, what can we do? And they became farm groups with farm aid funding. And a lot of them are still doing the same work today. And uh, then the next year, Willie sort of said, well, what's going on? It looks like we probably need to do this again. And he did. And there was another big Farm Aid concert. And again, it raised a lot of money. And um, what a lot of folks who remember that first concert don't know is we have done a concert pretty much every year since. And that is the main way that Farm Aid raises the money that we use to both continue to fund those grassroots organizations working with farmers all across the country and also fund our own internal work. And Farm Aid works 365 days a year. Um, so we have the one concert day, which is amazing and a big focus of our effort. But that funds the work that we do all the rest of the year, including operating a hotline for farmers, doing that grant making across the country, doing advocacy and policy work, and doing general education about why people should care about family farmers and, and what it means when they are lost. So what were the actual problems in 1985 that, you know, Willie Nelson and the and the crew and everybody and the farmers themselves were talking about and trying to solve? So, you know, they're they're not unsimilar to what we see or dissimilar to what we see today. At that time, um, the farm crisis had been brewing starting in the 1970s. And um, a lot of it had to do with us getting involved in um, export markets and, and really starting to develop this messaging that has been just so widespread and deeply taken in by farmers and, and by all of us who live in the U.S. that we feed the world. U.S. farmers feed the world. Um, and we can talk about how, on the one hand, yes, incredible messaging. On the other hand, really, really damaging, both in terms of what farmers do here and also what it means to farmers across the rest of the world. Um, I digress. <laughs> um, in the early 80s, we were seeing those export markets open up and there was this encouragement to farmers to grow, quote, fence row to fence row. And that was a quote from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the, this ag secretary at the time. So in order to do that, farmers were allowed to take out loans to do the expansion of their farms and the expansion of their production to feed these growing markets. Land prices went through the roof initially and then they just plummeted. And so farmers had received these loans and they were counting on great harvests to happen in order to pay those off. And in the meantime, you know, as land prices plummeted, so did markets and so did crop prices. And essentially, you know, the, the farm economy collapsed and farmers couldn't pay back those loans. At the same time, you had a, a new administration under the Reagan administration coming in to say, OK, we've got to get all this dead weight off the farm service agencies books. We don't want any bad loans on our books. So there was really a commitment from the president on down to terminate farmers loans and to push them off the land. And that really gave rise to an opportunity for the kind of consolidation and corporate power in both land and, you know, in, in agricultural markets that we see today. And so when Farm Aid started, that was sort of the, the peak moment when farmers were being pushed off the land, hundreds of thousands of farmers losing their land. And with farmers, of course, you know, their, their business is not just their business. This is not a small business where a Chapter 11 isn't, a, you know, an impossible thing to come back from. They also are losing their homes. They're also losing their family legacy that has been passed down through generations. So it was a really hard time. And in a lot of ways, you know, things have gotten better for farmers. And in a lot of ways, we're still challenged um, and they're still challenged with the same issues in, in addition to new ones. You know, when you talk about all these losses, 
I mean, they're losing their homes, they're losing their way of life and tradition, but the world is also losing their knowledge. Right, exactly. And that's why today, you know, one of the bright spots that we talk about is how many new farmers are coming from other cultures and bringing the cultures of their agriculture with them and and adding that into the culture of agriculture here in the U.S. So, right. <laughs> yeah, we, we talked spots. to Liz Carlisle about exactly that. Um, oh, gosh. She wrote this wonderful book. Anyway. It's one of my favorite books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't listened to that episode, look look for the Liz Carlisle episode, and we'll link to it in the show notes. So, okay, so the idea of these original concerts was to raise awareness so that the government would fix the problems. And it's it's interesting, you know, you raise seven million dollars. From one perspective, seven million dollars is a lot of money. From another perspective, it's a a tiny drop in the bucket. Yes. And so there are problems, and and this is something that you know, needs to be part of the national conversation always and ongoing. There are problems that can be fixed privately and there are problems that can only be fixed through, you know, through the public sphere, through government, through democracy, through citizen participation and the government that we elect. So, I mean, you've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, what got fixed? I mean, some things, the foreclosure crisis did get fixed, right? But what did... did what didn't? Yes. So, right. I think initially there was criticism, like, how are you going to hold a concert and raise the money to fix this problem? And there was never an assumption on Willie and John Mellencamp and Neil Young's part that, that, that that's what they were doing. It was impossible. I think at the time someone had done a calculation and figured out that with that $7 million raised, $0.11 cents would go to every farmer in the country. Right. Um, you know, farm debt is astronomical. And current farm debt is about $500 billion. So no one is going to raise that with a concert. It was all about the awareness. But the money that was raised was no tiny amount. And what it did was go to these groups that had literally been, you know, um, we talk a lot about a certain part of those groups, they were farm wives, that's what they called themselves. They were way more than that <laughs> in in that time. That, that's how they referred to themselves. Um, farm they were wives? Farm like wives, the, yep. Okay. Yep, and that's still a term that you often find in farm culture. But these women were, were not just mere farm wives. They were also farming themselves. They were keeping the books. They were keeping the family running and the household running. And these incredible people actually went out and um, they were fighting for their own farms. So they were learning, like, what are the regulations? What are our rights? How do we deal with the bank? What are the legalities of all of this? They went out and learned that. And then a lot of them managed to save their farms and then put those skills to work to save farms of friends and family and neighbors and even strangers. So there was this incredible grassroots uprising of folks just kind of figuring it out as they went. One of the main things that they encountered was a reluctance for farmers to talk about what they were experiencing. And again, there's sort of that feeling in the countryside, like farmers are very humble. Sometimes it is hard to get them to talk about even the good things that are happening, but it's certainly hard. And, and especially during that time, it was hard to get farmers to come forward and say, yep, we're struggling. And a lot of farmers didn't know that they weren't the only ones struggling. Right. And these, these advocates talk about that a lot, actually. We did this wonderful documentary film about these folks called Home Place Under Fire, which is a song that Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan wrote about the farm crisis, which is great. So Google that. <laughs> but um, there was this cultural barrier that really had to be broken down for these folks to go out and talk with farmers and help them understand, you know, what they were hearing from their loan managers and loan officers, whether it was with the farmer's home administration, um, which is now known as FSA, Farm Service Agency, or from their bank, all they were hearing was, you're a bad manager. You have done this. You're the reason your farm is failing. When, in fact, you know, all of these farms across the country were in the same boat and it was put upon them. They did not bring it upon themselves. So anyway, back to that money. <laughs> it was a small drop in the bucket. And also it helped to fund these folks who were doing this kind of work, it paid for phone bills for, for 
instance, this incredible advocate named Mona Lee Brock, who was in um, Oklahoma. She's one of these farm wives. And she was a school teacher. And she had training in social work. And she became nationally known for talking to farmers who were, you know, on the verge of considering suicide. She did this incredible work from her kitchen. And so farm aid funds were used to, to pay that phone bill. And for other organizations or, or groups of people, it helped to, you know, hire the lawyer so they could become the organization that could do fundraising and or to, to create an office and, and hire staff. But Yes, there was some policy put into place. One of the big wins after the first Farm Aid concert was the 1987 Farm Credit Act, which actually put a moratorium on farm foreclosures and instructed the banks and the farm service agency to work with farmers to restructure their debt. And that kept farmers on the land. It helped to ensure that they weren't at immediate risk of losing their farms anymore. And then, you know, we've continued to do that policy work and, and help other organizations do that policy work. It's still, it's still a challenge. And a lot of the work remains the same today. A lot of it based around credit access and, and fair and transparent regulations around farm lending and allowing farmers the flexibility um, and the opportunity to restructure when they do encounter hard times because... Ooh, I'm sure your listeners know it's really hard to be a farmer. There's so much that's out of your control, you know, especially with crop prices and disease and uh, pests and weather events. It's a really, a really tough occupation. And it's more than an occupation too. any farmer will tell you it's not just a job. A lot of the problems, as you say, either are the same or are even outgrowths of the stuff that was happening in the 1970s and 80s. And as you know, a lot of those foreclosures gave rise to consolidation and we're still still dealing with that. And then there's new problems. What are some of the new problems that have emerged in the last 30 plus years? I would say the the next thing that Farm Aid really dealt with after that initial crisis and then the sort of calming of the farm economy was the rise of industrial livestock production coming into rural America. It started first with hogs. And so in the 1990s, Farm Aid began hearing from hog farmers saying, you know, we've got no markets anymore. Pork is worth almost nothing. And there's this incredible glut of it on the market. And that's what's driving prices down. And the glut was driven by these industrial livestock operations. Initially, they were internal to the corporations. So one of our really close partners in this work has been Missouri Rural Crisis Center. Um, And they did a huge protest at Premium Standard Farms, which was one of the main players that was driving this. And that work has really continued and, and frankly, recently really ramped up, particularly as um, the chicken industry went in the same direction of creating contract growers. So after the initial rush to for the corporations to do their own pork production, they realized, okay, we might be better off contracting this out to growers. We might be able to kind of get away with it. And also put the the risk on the growers themselves. Right. Um, and this is especially true now in the poultry industry where they are asking folks who want to become poultry growers to commit to building these chicken houses on their farms and going into debt of, you know, a million dollars to put up four chicken houses. And sometimes they require more than four. And then getting into a contract and uh, those growers are receiving the chickens, which are owned by the company. They're receiving the feed, also owned by the company. And they're basically just, you know, growing the chickens out. The company comes back, picks them up, and then um, they receive this pay based on this very convoluted and non-transparent formula where the growers are essentially competing amongst each other without being told any transparency about it to see who can, you know, feed the least amount of feed to put the most amount of weight on the birds and and deliver the heaviest birds at the grow out time. 
So Farm Aid has been doing a lot of work in that industry along with many of our partners who are focused on that system. But yeah, that that corporate control of the market and corporate control of production and the way that a lot of poultry growers will tell you that that they've really made farmers serfs on their own land and they don't have control over the management decisions. And many of the poultry corporations are operating in areas where there aren't a lot of other job options. They're also operating in areas where there isn't a lot of competition. So you might sign up for one to grow chickens for one contractor. And in a healthy market, you would have maybe another contractor to choose from and see, well, where am I going to get a better price? And there often isn't that competition. And then when a contract gets canceled, which happens so often in this industry, then those growers don't even have another option for another processor to go to. And so that lack of competition is a big issue that we've continued working on. I mean, that's a huge problem. And it's it's one that I've become aware of through doing this podcast. What kind of solutions, what kind of political solutions are we looking at? Well, the political solutions are being fought for. Um, they're, they're sort of known. The challenge is that there's so much power that the meatpacking industry has. So even right now, what's unfolding in Capitol Hill at this very moment is that uh, folks in Congress are trying to hold up the next appropriations bill. So we're, we're approaching another government shutdown and they need to pass that bill. But many in Congress are saying we're not going to pass this bill without a rider included that will basically tie the hands of the U.S. Department of Agriculture from continuing to do the work to reform this industry. And that work started, gosh, a very long time ago. It started multiple times. But in in most recent history, it started during the Obama administration. And a lot of great work was done and and farmers and, you know, local food enthusiasts and all kinds of people that are advocating for a better food system were celebrating because these rules were coming down and they were going to increase transparency and increase fairness and level the playing field a little bit between these meat packers and livestock producers. And lo and behold, when the next administration came in um, with President Trump, the rules got canceled and just thrown out the window. Then when we had another administration change, the USDA put them back on the table and said, okay, we're going to come back to this work. Of course, they had to start from zero, and we've been waiting. And there's been one rule so far that has been announced and and more to come, but here we are with Congress once again saying we're going to throw a wrench in that and we're going to stop any reform. And it's all being pushed by the meatpacking industry. So we haven't talked about that yet, but that is the main thing driving this increased consolidation in corporate power is that... You know, those giant now multinational companies control so much of the market and they also unfortunately have a lot of power in Washington and can really bend the rules to their favor. Another problem or sometimes problem, sometimes opportunity that farmers are facing is renewable energy development. What does that look like? Well, we are just starting to hear about this more frequently on our hotline and as a PS, uh, Farm Aid does have a farmer hotline, and that started in 1985 during that first concert. And uh, we, we've operated that to this day. We have a team of operators. Uh, and we are hearing a lot from farmers who are really feeling the pressure of land development, whether it is private equity coming in and trying to take up land that has so much value and farm the heck out of it for their own profit or for energy development, or for other um, housing development or industrial development. The pressure on the land right now is really high, and I think we're going to continue to see that rise. Energy development in particular is, yeah, a real emerging challenge, I think. Some farmers are definitely reaping the benefits of alternative energy, particularly if they're doing it on their farm for their farm. Um, at a really small scale, but we're also seeing like everything, right? Every Our whole mantra in our country is bigger is better. You know, everything is about scale. So we see a lot of corporate 
plans to come in and do these large-scale wind farms and large-scale solar farms. And while there is some energy and excitement about, well, you can have a a solar farm and you can also have grazing taking place at the same time around that, and that dual use of the land could be really beneficial. But we do have, you know, we already have this incredible lack of access to farmland, both for, especially for new farmers, but even for people who are already on the land who might want to expand their operation or pass it down to another generation. The competition is just so hard um, and land values continue to be very high and, and out of reach, especially for new farmers, farming can be so capital intensive with that upfront investment in land and equipment and getting the whole operation started. This is a major challenge. So we're really watching that energy development question. And I think it really, it can be a great thing, right? Figuring out ways that we can have those dual uses of land. So we're producing renewable energy and we're also keeping farmers on the land and and doing well and producing food. That's going to be really crucial. So it really does come down to scale. I actually just had a conversation though yesterday with someone who works in this field and is really concerned about the land challenge. And they had just come from a conference in Wisconsin. And this really just gave me hope. They said the focus of the of the conference was on making sure that we're not developing farmland and we're not because Wisconsin, like many states in the Midwest and across the country, feels very strongly that agriculture is central to their identity and their economy and they want to make sure it's protected. But a point that was raised there was that actually the land base that is needed, and at least in this state, I was told, for renewable energy production for the state is less than the amount of farmland that's currently being used to grow corn for ethanol. So that had never occurred to me in this whole equation. And I thought, well, that is absolutely crucial because I think probably most of us are, are aware that ethanol is not as green as we are often led to believe. And we all know we have this monoculture of corn. So if we took a look at shifting that kind of energy, which is sold to us as green, but not quite measuring up and converted that to the renewable, then what do we have? And we, you know, converting it to renewable with that dual use um, and making sure that agriculture can coexist, then we might have some real positive moves there. So definitely an emerging issue we're keeping an eye on. And one of the pieces around that issue and a lot of issues in rural America is who gets to decide how much local control is there? Do towns, municipalities, counties get to make decisions about what happens in their area? Right. That has been a huge issue. And um, we started seeing it with the, the rise of these industrial Livestock farms, these CAFOs, can find animal feeding operations, or most commonly they're called factory farms. And the corporations who were involved in that industry kind of woke up and thought, oh yeah, there is some power here, and and in some areas the neighbors are able to shut these operations down, so we're going to fix that. So we saw a rise in attempts at the county and um, municipality and state levels to take away that local control. And I'm getting wind now that we're going to see that as well around this energy development too. But that ability for communities to decide for themselves democratically what kind of use they want their land to go to is absolutely critical. And there's a lot of great grassroots organizations doing that work now. Um, We've actually been helping one of our organizational partners in one of those fights up in uh, Minnesota. It's this um, dairy CAFO that has been seeking to expand beyond the current land use limits that are enforced by the county. And again and again and again, they have appealed the decision that would say, nope, you can't expand. And now they have the power of industry behind them. Initially, they had the milk processor who they contract with behind them. Now they've got all these huge farm industry representatives who are coming out to support them, putting money behind their appeals um, and putting their name and power behind those appeals. And this tiny little county is holding strong and saying, no, this is not what we want in our county. 
but you got to wonder, you know, how long we can keep fighting the power that we're up against. It's really intimidating. And I'm so grateful. There are so many grassroots groups and, and communities out there that are they're keeping the fight going. Yeah, it's like the people with the most lawyers win kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And the most money. Because it, you do have to put money behind those fights. The appeals are not cheap. Right. But eventually, you know, the community is going to run out of that money. So, you know, when is enough enough, basically? You know, and I, that's, that's the main question that I think these folks are asking. Like, you've already got these many cows in an area where our water supply is really fragile, particularly with the geology they have in this particular area. And, you know, when we're in this age of climate change and we don't have the snowpack anymore and we've got this extreme drought and these cycles of extreme drought and then extreme flooding, we, we have to be taking these kinds of things into consideration in how we're putting our land to use and how we're, you know, supporting for-profit businesses. Let's go back to the fun part for a second, which is <laughs> yay, <laughs> the annual festival. It's been happening. I don't know if you shut down at all during COVID, but basically it's been pretty much every year since 1985. What's it all about now? You know, is it still this gigantic event? Where does it happen each year? Tell us about it. Yay. I love to talk about our festival. It's my favorite. And and for most of our staff, it's the favorite time of year, too, because we're all involved in making it happen. We move it around the country. And that was a directive that Willie had from the get go. He wanted to be sure that we were moving it around to showcase farmers in different areas to get new people on board and have them experience it and get involved with supporting their local farmers. It gives us a chance to really get to know the different organizations that are operating on the ground to support farmers in the different regions and also the unique challenges that farmers have in those areas. And it does happen every year. We did have t actually two festivals during 2020, during COVID, they were virtual. But we did our first virtual show within the first month of the pandemic, recognizing that farmers everywhere had been hugely impacted. You know, schools and other institutions, restaurants, grocery stores that had been purchasing from farmers, you know, just immediately shut down those purchases. And um, farmers had all this produce and they had no markets and no way to get it to people and um, they were hurting. So in early April, we had our first virtual festival and we raised half a million dollars and uh, we got that money out into these grant programs for farmers impacted by the pandemic and those were really great programs we were working with a whole slew of organiza farm organizations across the country and we had come to a, um, a decision to divide up into regions and so the money got split into these regions of the country and then the organizations on the ground in those regions were the ones to decide, okay, this is how we're going to spend the money. And these are the farmers that we're going to reach out to, to make sure that they've got the support. And so for instance, in the Northeast, the organizations involved in that region decided black and brown and people of color farmers, indigenous farmers, they have been most impacted by this and by our farming policies, you know, since the beginning of time. And they said, we are only going to give these grants to BIPOC farmers. And that was that was an incredible decision that was made by the community. And it was a beautiful thing to see. And then also in 2020, we had our regular festival in September that was virtual, but it was a long one with a lot of different artists. And, and that also did really well. But it's the in-person ones that have become so galvanizing. We move it around the country. It's usually in September every year. And in 2007, we transitioned from calling it a concert to calling it a festival because in 2007, we really formalized that it was, yes, the music, but it was also a farm and food festival because that was the year we began doing what we call homegrown concessions, where we source all 
every single ingredient that is served in the back of the house and in the front of the house comes from a family farm source. We guarantee that the farmer who raised the product is receiving a fair price and that the product has been raised with some kind of ecological standard. So it might be organic, it might be local, um, might be grass fed. There are a lot of different kinds of uh, qualifiers, but that it's raised with some kind of standard that guarantees that that food cares about how it's how it was raised. And the other thing we did was this homegrown village, that's what we call it. And it's um, sort of like a mini county fair right in the middle of our festival, where festival goers can dig in to hands-on activities that teach them about um, the culture of agriculture. So they're learning how to compost, they're learning about local grains, they're learning how to do uh, rotational grazing, maybe all kinds of great activities that you can either do as a, a regular person who wants to get more in touch with the roots of your food or as a homesteader or as a farmer yourself. And yeah, and that that is just the most, it's the best way to capture people and bring them into our mission. So Farm Aid was, has always been about the farmers, but now with this element of the food and the activities, people who are coming just for the music, which is true of our concert, it's one of the greatest things about our event. We can bring people in every year who actually don't know much about agriculture or maybe don't think it impacts them very much. And we can bring them into this movement and um, really inspire them to get involved. And those elements of the interactive activities of meeting farmers right there at the festival, getting to know them, hearing about their challenges, seeing them up on stage with the artists, talking about issues like farm stress and mental health on the farm, or about corporate power in our food system, or about how climate change is impacting them on a daily basis on their farm. It really helps helps people get it and then go out and change their behaviors in ways that help them be more engaged with their food system and support local farmers. So, And I really appreciate the fact that you guys get and are transmitting the message that farmers play such a key role in climate change mitigation and resource management and biodiversity and all of those things. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I think Ever since the beginning of Farm Aid, the message has been, we need these folks. Like if we don't have farmers, we are in big trouble. And climate change is the most recent example of that. As opposed to looking across so many other things and feeling like, oh my gosh, none of this is helping the climate. You can turn to a farmer and see, wow, they can actually go out there today and do something <laughs> that's going to have an impact. They're sequestering carbon, they're regenerating our soil, they're caring for our water and our air and our soil. And that does have a direct impact. And to see people grasp that and get it like, oh, if I help a farmer, I'm helping myself. And that that has really been a main message of the work of Farm Aid ever since the beginning. But climate is like the greatest example of that because it is so clear how much agriculture can be help to our climate change challenge. So where's the next festival and when? Oh, I can't tell you. It's under what? wraps for now. <laughs> It's generally in September, um, which is a very hard time for farmers, we recognize, unfortunately, but because, you know, we are an outdoor festival, there's a certain period of time that works for doing that. And additionally, we have these incredible artists who come every year, they donate their time and their travel and their talent. And so September is a nice time for them to all come together. They're generally coming off their own tours and so we pull that together in September every year. We move it around the country. So it could be anywhere this year. And generally, we're announcing that come early summer. Yeah. So keep your ears and eyes tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokes. And people can find out more at farmaid.org. Um, there's lots of resources that people can also find there. There's a Farm Aid hotline. There's the Farm Resource Network. There's uh, directory search tools. There's the Farm Disaster Fund. And you can find out about all those things on the website. You also have a new podcast called Against the Grain. We do. Yeah, really excited to launch that one back in October, November. 
yeah, our team is really rolling with it and having a great time. And it, it pulls together the threads that make Farm Aid what it is. So typically the episodes have been involving an artist and a farmer or two or three um, and delving into an issue. And this first season, they've been taking each episode is looking at a different issue. And then we're going to be diving deep in future seasons to really flesh out those issues. So for February, we've got one running now about black land loss. It's Black History Month. We're highlighting black farmers and it's really exciting. It's great to hear. You know, I think especially in the beginning, I wasn't there in 1985, but I know um, from Carolyn that there was a bunch of pushback initially. Like what does Willie Nelson, what do these artists know about farming? And the reality is the farmers or the artists that we work with, many of them are farmers or they come from farm families or they come from farm communities and they're really committed to those folks who are on the land and growing our food and they know a lot about it. So um, I think listeners to the podcast um, are probably often surprised by that. And it's, it's really incredible, but I think it goes to the reality of our country and most of us are tied in some way to the land or or we were at some point in our ancestry and a lot of us really want to get back to that. Anything else you want to let people know about Farm Aid before we go? Another thing on our website that folks might like to check out is our Farm Bill 101. It is still a Farm Bill year. We thought we were in Farm Bill last year and we're still in it this year Um, (laughs) because of Congress, as we mentioned, having their challenges of getting work done. So there's a great Farm Bill 101. If you want to dive into some of the issues that we work on, you know, sometimes those are less front and center for Farm Aid because we know um, a good deal of our audience is really into the music and, and the joy. But you know, all of that makes it possible for us to do the work that we do, including policy work around the Farm Bill. And an opportunity that we have with that audience of people who are into the music and the joy is to really get them interested in things like the Farm Bill and and understand that it impacts all of us. So there's some good resources there, especially also around fair and competitive markets and, and the farm safety net for farmers and climate change. And there's a lot of great work happening. So thank you. This has been great. It's awesome to talk with you and and get to share the the love and the joy that is the work that I get to do at Farm Aid. Well, thank you. It's it's really been fun and and instructive. I also have to say, I mean, you're you you guys are nonprofit and therefore nonpartisan, but if people do want to get involved in the political side of it, you make it really easy. Like there's some ways that people you can send messages to Congress and things like that through your website. And that's, I think it's just really useful because the morass that is Congress right now, but also even in the best of times or the, or an ideal world, there's so much to try to grasp and having somebody whose work you believe in kind of distilling that for citizens is just a really useful thing. Yeah, absolutely agree. And and all of our work in that area is informed by our partners who are made up of and representing farmers. It all connects. And what we're hearing on the hotline from farmers helps us understand what's happening in the countryside, um, what farmers are up against, and where we should be putting our attention. So it's a wonderful kind of circular loop that helps us really know what's going on out there and what is the change that needs to happen um, and pushing for that and, and bringing more and more voices to push for that change. Jennifer Fahey, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. 
And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.